Okay, we're good. Great. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hopefully, you guys are connecting to the audio and able to hear me okay. Um, shout out if you can't. <laughs> Um, thanks everybody for, for being here and thank you for inviting me to give this talk to you today. Um, it's really exciting to be part of a community that's excited about AI or autonomous systems more broadly speaking. Uh, so my name is Ajahn Moon. I'll tell you a little bit about myself uh, shortly as well. Uh, in this talk, we kind of put a hashtag called, you know, on, on AI ethics for, for this particular talk. But today, what, what I'm really going to be talking about is really this topic of how do we build a resilient technological society um, with a highlight on interactive robots. So uh, this might be a little bit of a new concept for, for you or new, new topic for, for some of you who have been looking at AI from more of the algorithmic side of the story. Um, today, I'll add a, a bit of an element of how do we build robots that actually roam around in our physical world? Um, and, and how does that disrupt our society? And what do we do? OK, so let's, let's get started. Um, let's see. So uh, just a little bit about me. As I mentioned before, I'm Ajung. Um, I direct the Responsible Autonomy and Intelligent Systems Ethics Lab here at McGill. We call it the RAISE Lab. And I specialize in this research call, uh, research domain called human-robot interaction, um, which is essentially a field that's interested in building robots that interact with people in a fluent, friendly, safe kind of a way. Um, and, and the goal here is really, you know, robots can be a very complicated thing. It, it not only has its body, as you can see, uh, uh, um, right next to me is a Pier 2 robot, 27 degrees of freedom, very complex system um, with physical actuators and sensors that it has. But you also have the intelligence that you program into the, the system. So imagine bringing uh, or, or having a goal of bringing this kind of complex system into somebody's home. Um, and you don't want this, this new user to have to study through 500 pages of a user manual before turning on the robot. So the, the field of HRI is really interested in creating intuitive kind of interactions so that our interaction with these systems are safe and have human uh, humans in mind. Uh, on top of just human robot interaction, I've been studying this domain called roboethics. That's really talking about how do we think about ethics in developing these systems um, and, and the broader social implications as well. I've been part of many different uh, organizations before. Some of the logos you might recognize here um, uh, as more local. Uh, I've taken part in a nonprofit institute called the Open Robotics Institute. I'll borrow some of the research results from that institute here. It's a Canadian think tank that's been looking at this topic before. Um, and I've did, I have did did a very short stint in technology policy at the United Nations, and I'll borrow a, a bit of a work from there as well. And I've done some, some startup work looking at bringing the notion of ethics into AI, um, AI companies or uh, projects, AI projects and companies rather. So I have a bit of a mixed background. So hopefully uh, at the end of the talk, you will ask me some questions about um, you know, different perspectives that I have, or maybe we can open up the floor to have more of a broader discussion there. Um, okay, so I, I, I bring this kind of human robot interaction or interaction researchers perspective to thinking about the role of autonomous systems uh, in our, our society. Uh, but I, let me let me start from the very beginning here. Um, most of you are probably coming from uh, some sort of engineering or computer science or a technical background, and part of part of the reason why I got into this domain in the first place or or decided to become a roboticist was that I thought technology is really the the superpower for humans, <laughs> um, and and this is you know if we. Uh, if we develop these autonomous systems that can help people um, build things that are automated, that can build things cheaper, safer, and more interactive and so forth, uh, wouldn't that lead to a better society? And I think you will you will agree with me that most of most of us, the technology, so to speak, 
enter into technological domains or study it because we believe in the power of technology to bring something good in the world. We like to think of ourselves as, as superheroes. Now, with that, with that um, background in mind, something striking is happening in the real world war today. And these are uh, some of the slides that I've that I'm borrowing from Edelman, um, which runs uh, something called Trust Barometer every year and has been for, uh, for a number of years now. Um, what you see in front of you is a survey that they have taken of 28 different markets across the world. And that's a shorthand to, to speaking about 28 different countries. And they ask people a few different questions. Um, and in particular, what you're seeing here is about the, the question about whether AI has any positive impact in, in the world, right? Um, I've highlighted the, the, the Canadian market here. The numbers here are, are quite striking. So 29% of the, the Canadian population says, um, yeah, well, AI, uh, the, the overall impact is more of a, a negative side. 27% are both in the positive and negative side. They're kind of ambivalent about the actual impact and uh, about a quarter of the population is saying um, it, it's going to be a positive impact. Okay, so it's a little bit split. And, and some of you may say, oh, hold on, Professor Moon, it's not 100%, it doesn't add up. <laughs> um, and that's, that's, uh, that's typical of these kind of surveys where you have some missing data, so they're not including it there. Uh, but if you, if you think about this, uh, most of the time when I talk to technologists, I think we, we have some informed skepticism about the impact that algorithmic systems or autonomous systems can bring into play. Uh, but I think majority of the times we're quite positive about the impact technology can have in the society. And it's, to, it's surprising to me when I see these numbers where if you add it up, 56% of people have at least some doubt about the, whether AI has positive impact in the world. So as somebody who thinks technology is our superpower, it's a bit striking. Um, so another, another perspective on, on this, this is from the same, same survey research that's been done by Edelman in 2020, so very recent uh, research result. You can see right on the, on the left-hand side um, is Canada. So what they're, what they're showing you as a red bar is essentially the market that mostly distrust the technology, right? So this is essentially saying, you know, the, the percent of people who trust in artificial intelligence or robotics technologies. In Canada, only 44% of our population uh, trust the technology. And why do they have a minus eight here? That means uh, compared to 2019 version of this study, uh, Canadians are becoming more distrust, uh, distrusting towards these technologies. So 8% drop in the overall trust uh, on these technologies. Okay, so uh, this should give us uh, a second to pause <laughs> because this means that we're not, uh, we're, we're, when we're designing these technologies or getting excited about it or learning about it, um, we need to keep in mind that the target market or the, the users that we have in mind aren't necessarily looking at these technologies from only the positive perspective. They don't necessarily share the positivistic kind of per perspective we might have about these technologies. And they have some good reasons for that. And I'll get to that in, in a second as well. Um, and, and just to note in, in, in this particular graph as well, you might see that overall and across the world, uh, there are quite a few red bars, uh, especially in the developed countries where uh, people aren't necessarily trusting of these technologies. Part of the reason for this, part of the underlying reasons why we have these uh, trust issues with the users or the larger population uh, and autonomous systems more broadly speaking is because of this misalignment between uh, ethics, moral or normative values that we hold as a society, as individuals and how these technologies are disrupting our moral system. 
Now, there are many different layers of ethics issues that I can get into. Uh, there are four different layers I can I can actually get into, but I'll I'll briefly discuss the first layer and then go a bit deeper into the second layer, which is where my research is more um, uh, focused on. So the first first layer of ethics related questions is really really about investment or application. It's really a question about um, where should we deploy these autonomous systems in the first place? Do we want uh, robots in military? Do we want them to make these lethal, what, uh, lethal system, uh, lethal decisions rather, about whether to um, shoot this particular target or not, or whether to uh, let machines make a targeting decision? Right. Uh, that's a striking example on the investment or application. So, should we deploy them in this application or not? The second layer of the the ethics issues arise from um, the design and deployment stage of these technologies. So that's, you know, once we've decided that we're going to have this particular AI or robotics, uh, robotic technologies out in the world for this particular application, then now you need to make decisions that is specific to designing of those technologies in the first place. So um, what are some of the parameters? Or what's the consequence of picking this versus that? The third layer comes in as a, a, at the governance level. Level. So this is really when you are, you have designed a system or in the late stage of the designing and you're deploying this system, then you need to start to think about okay how do we how do we monitor these systems so that we know that things are not going wrong, or how do we even govern or regulate the society so that we protect the society from uh, a specific type of harm that is possible from the technology. And last layer of it is much more of a broader science, science fiction or uh, larger than life kind of philosophical questions about um, should robots have rights? <laughs> is singularity real? Uh, should we talk about um, AI safety? What does it mean to be living with robots, um, uh, human-like robots in the, in, in the future? So those are the three, four different layers. I definitely won't go to get into number four, uh, but let's start from the first layer. What, what do they actually look like? There, okay. Um, so autonomous cars is a great example to talk about this first layer of ethics issues. Um, I'm sure many of you have an opinion about whether autonomous cars are overall positive or net, net negative kind of a technology. But many, many years ago, I think this is from 2014 from the Open Robotics Institute, um, we've conducted a study asking people about what kind of jobs they think will be created or displaced by the rise of fully autonomous systems or cars. And as you can see in the graph here, uh, majority of the people said, well, okay, taxi drivers, I think that they'll, they'll have a, um, their jobs will be replaced, uh, followed by public transit workers, delivery people, and so on and so forth. So there were obviously uh, quite a range of different jobs that people thought would be displaced. And then there were also jobs that people said would be created, such as jobs in autonomous cars design and deployment, more tech jobs, uh, infrastructure jobs, and so on and so forth. Okay, so after getting these people to reflect on the job displacement versus creation element of autonomous cars, we asked people, the same people, whether uh, overall more jobs will be created versus displaced. And that's the, the graph that you see up here. So you see that a uh, majority of the, of the people, so 73% of people said more jobs will be displaced versus created. Only I think 19% of the people said more will be created. And then the same number of people, same participants again, were asked whether, considering all of that, do you think the technology will have more positive than negative impact on our society? And 90% percent of the people said yes for positive. Okay. What does that tell us? Does that mean, okay, it's support for autonomous cars. I think it's a great opportunity um, because everybody thinks it is positive. Well, um, we could interpret it that way and say, check, tick mark for that, that first layer of ethics considerations. Uh, but we do need to, at the application level, consider the ramifications of these technologies that we don't necessarily see when we answer these kind of questions. 
So the photo I have on the right hand side is, um, uh, is from New York many, many years ago. Um, the taxi drivers in, in New York have a particular status or, or um, uh, incentive structure. And by the rise of car sharing, um, Uber, and, and even the, the discussion of autonomous cars, um, and, and the, the implications for their jobs, uh, they, had a, they had a record number of suicides uh, of the taxi drivers because of the different investment structure that they now need to um, deal with. So real lives were actually changed by the rise of technologies that weren't really captured at the beginning of the investment of these technologies in the first place. Um, you might say, well, but that's, that's a minority of people. Still, autonomous cars are net positive, isn't it? Uh, but we have larger kind of issues being, um, being brought into play because of technologies more broadly speaking. So uh, these are six of many different issues that I can talk about, uh, but here are some numbers here. For example, in 2016, within a six month period, we saw 945 data breaches, 4.5 billion records. That's 2018. Who knows how, how uh, that the numbers might have changed in 2020 or if we were to update that number. We have real issues of, uh, in, in protecting children online. A third of the internet's users are under 18 years old. Uh, most of the the technologies that are being developed for the internet um, aren't in that population. Some of you may have heard about the issues of disinformation um, in the social media and other kind of platforms, uh, and, and may be familiar with things like hate speech, freedom of speech, the, the, the contrasting viewpoints there, uh, and of course, security and in encryption. All of those things are coming into the fore as issues that lead us to distrust different digital technologies. Intelligence in autonomous systems uh, is an added layer on top of all of these issues, which brings me to the point about resilience. Now, resilience as a definition is essentially the capacity to recover quickly uh, from difficulties. I think as we design and um, hold dear to the, the, the positive promise that autonomous systems um, uh, bring to, to our uh, positive thinking about the technology or promise for the, for the future rather, um, we need to really think about the fact that we're going to screw up. We're going to have, uh, we're going to make some mistakes and some people will have a really tough time because of certain decisions that we make. So the question is really this, how do we build a resilient technological society together, given that we're not going to be getting it right every single time? I believe that is really at that second layer of the ethics issues we can, we can talk about, which is we are investing in these technologies in the first place, and we are deploying them in many different application domains. What is important is for us to make the right decisions as engineers in every step of the way so that we can catch ourselves in uh, more, many more ways than one. Okay, so let me, let me give you an example of what that second layer of decision making looks like. Here's a case study uh, that we've conducted or uh, a poll that we've conducted with uh, the Open Robotics Ethics Institute again many years ago. So imagine this case, uh, Emma is a, an alcoholic and uh, she was in the hospital and dispatched to go back home. Now, uh, because she's still recovering and so forth, and she has this futuristic robot at home uh, that is able to fetch her a drink or any kind of objects. Now, she's, the doctor said, do not drink anymore. <laughs> and Emma asks the robot to fetch her a drink, an alcoholic drink. Uh, the question that we posed to the participants was this, should the robot be programmed to fetch her the drink against the doctor's orders? We had two different versions for this question. In one version, we, we told the participants that Emma is the owner of this robot. On the other case, we said Emma is not the owner, but it, the robot may be a loaner. It may be uh, bought by somebody else as a gift or something else. Um, but ownership was essentially the factor here. And here are the results here. Okay, 
Um, when Emma was framed as the owner of the robot, then a majority of the, the people said, well, at least sometimes get her the drink. But when the ownership was shifted, so it's somewhere else owning the robot, the majority of the people said never. Okay. Well, this, is, this, should, this should surprise you, <laughs> I think, because if you think about ownership in human-human um, -human relationships, such as a nurse in a care home setting, then you don't even, you don't think about a nurse making a different decision because of your ownership of the nurse. There is no owning of a human here, right? Um, you don't, you expect the nurse to have the common sense and the decision-making skills to make the right decisions. For a robotic system, you need to be very explicit about the values and your judgments you're programming into the system at the design time. Now, we weren't sure, okay, is that something about alcoholism? That was really tricky. And so we tried with a different scenario with the same number of people, same group of people rather, uh, a story about Jack, the obese, and he's not supposed to have junk food. And we see here the same kind of pie graph that you can see. Uh, and when you ask the people, the same people, whether ownership should influence the decision making of a care robot, then we get some something like this 50 50 essentially. So, sorry, the pie graph is a little bit small here. Essentially, even though uh, most of the people answering these questions change their answers between the Jack owns the robot versus someone else's, else owns the robot, people are really split about whether ownership should make a difference. So what does that tell us? Um, as engineers, we we like to we, we like having clear decisions. Okay, you you um, you know how to do calculus, you know how to um, derive, integrate, whatnot, and there's a clear solution to technical questions. But when you have a design decision such as okay, should, who's whose decision should I follow? <laughs> um, who's who's um, whose value am I serving when I make th these decisions, you don't actually have a clear answer when the population gives you something like a 50-50 answer. And this is not the only kind of a design, design decision. Um, even very simple things and very today oriented um, question uh, that a futuristic care robot setting, we can also see the similar kind of results here. What you're seeing here is a collaboration with the Korea Transport Institute looking at policy making for autonomous cars in, in South Korea. And we asked both English speaking population and uh, South Korean population um, whether uh, third party programmers should be able to uh, distribute software modifications to semi autonomous cars. So essentially, you know, should uh, autonomous car software be open source? allow people to tweak around uh, or find find bugs, uh, provide patches and stuff like that. And half of the population is saying no. And the rest are kind of split here, right? Okay, okay. Um, okay. On the other side, sorry, there was an echo there. <laughs> Uh, on the other side, we can we can also talk about uh, software updates to um, to the safety feature of, of the system. This was a scenario where we presented people. Okay, um, you bought a car, and there will be software updates, uh, and some of the so software updates will be safe, safety critical. Now, should you, Joe, in this case? Um, have the autonomy or the right to hold off on your safety update? Should you be given that choice in the first place? And you'll see that only 38% of, of the population said, yes, you should be able to hold off on safety critical updates. And some of you may argue, well, okay, that doesn't actually make sense because it is safety critical. It may not be the safety, the safety of the driver or the rider but it may implicate the public safety at large, right? So that means by you making a decision, it has implications for others. So what does that mean for you to be a programmer of autonomous cars in making these decisions? These are pretty tricky. <laughs> I don't think we have really clear solutions to this. And these are very value laden questions and we don't have technical means of addressing these questions, but they're very, very important.
So many years ago, when I was a graduate student, I decided, okay, I need to, I need to solve these issues. I need clear cut answers to inform people of engineering design decisions. So um, myself and a bunch of my friends decided to put together a little survey. Uh, again, a little bit of a dilemma scenario. Um, we had a scenario where this PR2 robot that I showed you before, um, it, it was actually programmed to be able to ride an elevator fully autonomously, but because it is bulky, it can't share the elevator with a person. And so we created these different everyday dilemma scenarios where the PR2 is delivering something or trying to deliver something to somebody on a different floor. And uh, by the time it gets to the elevator, somebody is already waiting for the the um, waiting to use the elevator or somebody is inside the elevator already or already using it. Um, and we have very different kind of factors to, to this as well. Uh, we said the person who is waiting for the elevator is in a wheelchair, just like what you see in the video there, or uh, carrying heavy objects or, you know, just a regular, regular Joe doing um, nothing much special there. And we, we varied the urgency of the, the mail bill being delivered. And so we launched these different dilemma scenarios to the, to the public and we asked people, what should the robot do in those kind of cases? Should the robot yield the elevator to the person? Should it not yield? Uh, should it not do anything <laughs> or engage in a dialogue? And the highlighted sections um, are essentially showing you that when there is a, a contentious scenario between the robot doing something urgent, so a high priority action, and somebody is um, waiting or inside the elevator already, so contentious situation, then most of the people said engage in a dialogue, actually interact and figure out what the context is. And so I thought, okay, okay, I have an answer. I have an answer here. Um, at the end of that study, we actually incorporated the, the um, findings from that and incorporated them into a machine learning system. So we can demonstrate that we can program a robot with the, the most popular, um, popular socially appropriate behaviors. Uh, but the, the broader takeaway I thought I had was, okay, maybe an ethical robot is a robot that gives people a say in what should happen next, that engage in a dialogue uh, so that the, the programmer who has never met a, a user in the first place just kind of decides and, and programs and there's nothing else. That doesn't seem like the right kind of way to go. Maybe we design robots to be interactive so that whoever is interacting with the robot at that point in time makes a decision collaboratively. And so back many years ago when I was doing my thesis, uh, hopefully the video is loading in front of you as well. Um, I thought, okay, I'm going to demonstrate that this is possible. So I designed a robot to, um, to respond to different conflicts with uh, conflicts of, of resource when a robot is reaching for the same thing at the same time as a person. So the video you saw is uh, more of a traditional emergency stop behavior you see in factories with robots where it sees something uh, as a conflict or a safety uh, issue and then it'll just smoothly stop. But that's not how humans do it. Humans actually interact and negotiate. So I created this very human-like behavior called hesitation, where the robot will be you know, doing back and forth. And when there is a conflict scenario, then it will hesitate with its wrist as though it is actually um, negotiating with a person. Hopefully the video is loading well enough that you can see the little uh, nuanced gesture here. So what I was able to show is that this is possible. Humans actually can safely engage with robots and, and, um, and collaborate and resolve conflicts in real time. That was all great. Um, and then we got results like this. Okay, uh, back in the days, the only things we really cared about, or at least I cared about when I was designing these interactive systems was actually measuring, okay, um, is that actually an effective way of resolving conflicts? Were there any safety concerns? Uh, we were able to show that when you have this negotiative hesitation behavior that I showed you, that I created, um, then overall the, the task completion time is shorter. So the shorter is better in, in this particular graph versus emergency stop behavior uh, where it took longer. I thought, okay, this is really great. Um, except when I asked people whether people noticed 
um, that they were yielding to the robot at, at certain points in time. They said, no, I, I don't think I yielded. <laughs> but when I look back on each of the video recordings of these, these experiments with 33 participants, uh, majority of the participants actually yielded to the robot. That wasn't really what I had intended in the first place when I launched into this study, because I really wanted this kind of balance where the user has a say in, in being able to get, for, get that object before the robot regardless, right? Or, or have a true negotiative behavior. Um, so in, in a way, the lesson I took away from that work is that we have much more work to do in understanding how design of these systems influence people, uh, both in our perception, perception as well as our reaction. Um, it, and and uh, some of the examples that I'll give you, I'll, I'll show you, um, it should convince you that robots are actually an intelligent, physical embodiment of things that influence people, sometimes in a troubling way. So let's take a look at a few different examples. So the one example that I just showed you from my uh, PhD work was robots can move in a way that is very negotiative, but at the end of the day, it gets the first priority raise. Okay. Um, but the robots can be designed to look at specific spots um, to elicit you to move in a particular way. So the top, uh, top left-hand corner uh, is a work that I've done in, in uh, robot handovers. So we were really interested to see if robot looking at specific points in space when, when it's handing over an, an object, such as a water bottle to a person, uh, communicate something about what the robot is doing so that you as a participant or recipient of this water bottle will reach out and grab that water bottle faster. <laughs> you can imagine that, yes, that, that sounds like a great goal for human-robot interaction because that means you're creating more fluent interaction. And that is ultimately the goal for human-robot interaction research. And that is indeed what we found. Just by changing the way the robot is looking at different points, at different points in an in a autonomy interaction like this, you can change the way you respond in, um, with the, towards that robot. We also have research from human-robot interaction showing that just by having a robot in the room, you're going to cheat less. You're going to be, uh, you're going to make decisions um, as though you have a human proctor in in the room. And we also have some some leading research uh, showing that having many robots saying the same thing can actually lead you to conform to the answers of the robot. So at the very bottom, um, the figure here is taken from uh, what's what's known as the Ash Line experiment. So uh, this is a very uh, traditional psychological experiment where uh, people uh, wanting to study how having many people say the wrong answer will lead to you, the participant, uh, saying the wrong answer. And typically the experiment goes like this, you know, um, an experimenter goes up and, and shows you multiple lines, A, B, C, and one line and says, okay, which one, which one has the same length? And there is usually one obvious answer uh, and it's not very hard to find. And you see the, the correct answer all the way through in, in a group setting. Um, and then at some point, you know, you're in, in a room full of confederates or essentially uh, experimenters who start to all together say the wrong things. For example, the answer is A in this case. And if you hear four people say the wrong answer, um, then the probability that you're going to also say A as the right answer increases. That's, that's the, the conformity effect. The question is, can robots do that? <laughs> can robots lead us to make, make the wrong choices in that case? And we're starting to see a bit of the results that that is really the case, not necessarily when the answers are really obvious, but when there are uncertainties to the answers. People tend to lean to what the robot suggests as the right answer more often. More interestingly, we were talking about trust in the very beginning of the presentation here, um, but in human robot interaction research, again, we also find evidence of troubling uh, ways in which we over trust robotic systems. On the left hand side is an experiment that uh, Maha Salem et al conducted where they got brought a, a bunch of participants into this um, this uh, this room, uh, somebody else's office, so to speak, or a house kind of a setting. 
And while they waited for whoever it is um, uh, is the owner of this particular space, um, there was this butler robot, as you can see there. And this robot was telling the participants, well, do take a sit. Uh, the John will be a little bit late. But John actually told me to tell you to take the stack of the letters on the table and toss it in the, in the garbage. Uh, John also told me to take this bottle of orange juice and pour it into a planter with a light plant in it. <laughs> Those are the things that people typically would not do if told by a person. But uh, strikingly, in this particular study, they found that majority of the participants actually follow through with those strange requests given by a robot. And you might say, oh, well, OK, um, maybe that's because of this, of this novelty factor. On the right hand side is a similar finding um, where they brought subjects in and then introduced this robot as a faulty robot. They're working on this robot. The robot is supposed to lead you to an, an emergency evacuation, um, an emergency exit, but it's, it's still faulty, so it's not going to direct you. By the way, the emergency exit is that way. So everybody was, was trained. And they mocked this emergency scenario, a fire alarm scenario, and they observed whether the participants followed the robot or went through the right exit. So the robot was programmed to go through the wrong exit, as in there was no exit. Uh, and majority of the participants actually followed the robot, fully knowing that the robot is faulty and you, you may not lead you to the right direction. And they have the right answer. So um, these are some of the examples uh, highlighting how robots can influence humans in uh, troubling decision making. But then we can also think about it from a, a different standpoint. This is a video, hopefully it loads on your end as well. Um, this is a video taken at a shopping mall in Japan. Uh, Robo V, which is the robot that you see here, is patrolling this mall area. And what you see here are a bunch of children actually essentially bullying the robot. Um, some of them are just kind of blocking the way, as you can see here dancing around, poking, holding hands, and, and kind of overall uh, abusive behavior, physically speaking. OK. So looking at this, um, we have to ask the question of how do, we, how do we want people to treat robots? How do we want to design robotic systems knowing that this kind of interaction can take place? how do, do we want robots to kind of say, oh, stop it, <laughs> or self-defense, or whatnot? Where, where in social hierarchy should we be placing the robot in the first place? The researchers here in particular took a look at it and decided, OK, so the best course of action is to take a look at what are some of the highest likelihoods of bullying behaviors taking place? What are some of the features for that? Um, and came up with a predictive model to avoid those situations in, in, uh, at the end of the day. Uh, turns out when there are adults in the room, children don't bully robots as much. So uh, the, the kind of algorithmic behavior was the robot actually going towards an adult uh, when there are too many children around. Similarly is a video that I love, <laughs> which is uh, taken from, I believe, a two th early 2000s um, uh, in, on the streets of South Korea. What you see here is a little girl uh, looking at a, a robot, a very simplistic robot. There's no, no, not even intelligence built in, into this. It's a mannequin that is bowing back and forth. And you see this little kid bowing back at the, at the um, adult person. And you would be like, oh, this is so adorable, right? It is adorable, but also troubling because uh, I'm, a, a, I'm South Korean myself. So I understand this cultural context, which is when an adult, somebody older than you is bowing uh, to you, then you bow back. That's the, that's the only polite and culturally uh, appropriate solution to, to the situation. There is social hierarchy there. Uh, but just by having a robotic system that looks adult-like and that is bowing, which has cultural and social context, you can actually elicit a child to behave in this particular way. Okay. If this just if if, if this is just one child <laughs> reacting this way, then yeah, okay, this is adorable and video taken and, and that's all good to go. But it brings a larger contextual question about how do we 
want children, including the people category, to treat robots? How do we want to design robots to be treated by people in a particular way? So hopefully this gave you a few different things to think about. Um, one, of the, one of the ways that I'm, I'm trying to frame these different questions is that these eth ethics related questions arise about robotic systems and uh, more broadly speaking, digital technologies and AI. Um, they, they come about because they're becoming our new kind of infrastructure. When we talk about infrastructure, we typically think about highways, streets, roadways, and, and, and bridges and things like that. Uh, but Facebook, social media, digital technologies more broadly, even Jibo or other kind of robots you see as more consumer oriented robots that are coming into the market today, they are becoming our new infrastructure where we can change the behaviors of people at, in mass uh, at, at scale um, just by programming. Right, and we need to think about the power dynamics at play, because typically um, when we think about infrastructure, they are mostly public related uh, projects with governance structures, but most of these technologies coming into our lives are actually private uh, projects coming from uh, com companies. So hopefully also from some of the examples that I've mentioned today, you have an, an understanding that, well, when we talk about AI ethics or robot ethics, it's really not about preventing this lone um, one evil engineer who really has terrible ideas and, and hacking away at, at certain things, but it, it has to do with the broader kind of context, uh, broader discussion we should have about what kind of society do we want to build for the future with the technologies in mind. And this is a kind of discussion that we are having already at the broader, um, broader landscape. Um, and back in 2019, um, is when, uh, no, 2018, uh, sorry, is when the UN Secretary General decided to launch a project at the international level to look at digital cooperation. Uh, and this is really the, the notion of thinking about how do we resolve this issue of cooperating with each other across jurisdictions when we have so many different technological issues taking place um, across, the, the, across the spectrum. Um, you might recognize some of the famous faces there, Jack Ma, Melinda Gates, and, and so forth, big names, uh, and they produce a report called The Age of Digital Interdependence. And the key that I will highlight here for you is the Declaration of Digital Interdependence. Uh, essentially, I, I think this really goes into the, the answer to building a resilient technological society, which is that all of us are part of the becoming stewards to the, the innovation journey that we are in. All of us should be helping to monitor and acknowledge that all of the technologies that are bringing into the world have rippling effects that we need to be able to impact together. So as stewards, both at the, as the user and as technology developers, I think we need to be much more tightly coupled in having these discussions. There are many different projects out there that are trying to make a difference in, in this ethics sphere. Um, some of them have come out as principles, AI ethics principles, and some of you may have heard about them. Uh, Berkman uh, Klein Center did a study a few years ago looking at 35 different AI ethics principles that came out in the last three, four years. And they, they essentially said, okay, we are, we're actually in agreement with these categories of things. Um, things like human rights is important, uh, transparency, safety, accountability. These are the things that we all, all across the board agree. They're also, going back to the Edelman uh, trust barometer that we started with, they're also pointers to improving the level of trust 
uh, that the public is looking for in technologies. Uh, if you take a look at the first column, which talks about artificial intelligence and robotics, then, um, then I think they, we have a, a similar kind of a breakdown for the things that we could be doing. We could be doing better in communicating the downsides and the risks. Um, there are also support for things like developing code of ethics uh, and CEOs pledging for safe and ethical use and so on and so forth. In general, I think the bigger picture perspective is to really try and figure out how to incorporate these ethics into, into the development uh, or design decisions that we make. And we don't actually have a clear answer to how to, how to do that. We, have, we are building on the existing research called uh, value-sensitive design, human-centered design, and other kinds of design processes. But there is an additional layer that, we, uh, that the um, the domain of AI ethics and roboethics is struggling to put into place, uh, especially in translating some of the principles that we share into practice. What you see in front of you is essentially a few of many different toolkits and guidelines that are just coming into, um, into the world so that you, as you develop your own AI systems or any kind of autonomous machines, then you can try them out and uh, keep yourself in check with some of the ethics, ethical implications of the technologies you bring to play. So I will leave you with uh, one last graph here. So this is a graph that I recently made for a paper that'll be out um, hopefully soon. And this is essentially just a, a quick search on Web of Science in the words roboethics and AI ethics. So roboethics was coined back in 2005. And so I thought, well, this would be really interesting to see how the, the field has grown. And as you can see here, uh, roboethics has, has been enjoying a continuous kind of a linear, maybe an exponential growth. And you'll see AI ethics popping up, 45% uh, fold increase in 10 years uh, and 12 fold increase in five years in terms of research publications that's been out. And that just looking at, you know, 2015 to 2020. What that means is AI ethics in particular, in contrast to roboethics, although roboethics is also very young, they're both very, very young fields. That means we are also, we're not only seeing the popularity of the terms because it's such an urgent issue, but it is also very popular because we need so much work done to get it right, um, to really build in the sense of resiliency uh, in, in keeping the checks and balances of the design decisions we make in place. So there are many different things we can do. Um, for those of you uh, who are here, hopefully you're here because you, would, you want to educate yourself in different kind of uh, ethical impl implications. Um, who, some of you may be really interested in research. I would absolutely encourage you to participate and test out some of the toolkits, principles, uh, poke around and really ask critical questions because they are really needed uh, and, and we need to do much more research and to be able to share knowledge about these AI ethics related topics because no one really likes to be judged for the ethics of uh, the AI project that you've put into place. But once you have done an AI ethics risk assessment, for example, for your, your, um, your particular project, be it a term project, be it for your startup, making it out into the world will encourage others to share the knowledge about the lessons learned as well. So I've been talking a lot, <laughs> a lot. So, um, so I will leave it here, but this is my, uh, my small team at the Raise Lab right now. We are a growing team. Um, as I might've mentioned way, way back earlier in the talk, I've only started a couple of years ago. Um, so I encourage you to apply for internship, the SURE program and other kind of ways to interact with each other so that we can do this kind of research uh, here at McGill or Montreal community at large or across Canada. Thank you for listening. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I believe we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, um, thank you so much for the really interesting talk, Professor Moon. If anyone has questions, feel free to send them in the chat and I can read them out or you can just unmute and ask. Okay, uh, so someone asks, do you think the general consensus towards AI has shifted because of COVID? Mm. Oh, that's a possibility. Um, hmm. 
Yeah, uh, but but if if that is the case, I, I would have to critically think about why why it is that uh, certain markets saw more of a uh, drop in trust <laughs> trust uh, scale than others. For example, Canada was the um, the the trust uh, measurement in Canada dipped the farthest out of the twenty eight um, yeah twenty eight markets that they've studied. So why not the US? Why not uh, South Korea? Why not some other countries, right? Yeah, I, I don't think I have a, a clear answer to that, but I think I, I think it's a possibility, but a curious one. <laughs> uh, hi, uh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for your talk, it was very interesting. So um, you mentioned that a lot of those uh, ethical challenges don't really have a clear, uh, well-defined uh, answers. Um, also, the, the need for a responsible uh, ethical development uh, in the field of AI. So um, do you think that there is a real need for more uh, independent uh, research into ethical challenges and not research being done by uh, big companies such as Google, for example? Uh, earlier this year, or at the end of 2020, I believe, uh, a leader, leading research scientist, a black woman at Google, uh, Dr. Gebru got sacked uh, after having written a research paper that was rejected. Mm -hmm. And I know that a lot of people in the Google community uh, criticized this move. So uh, could you tell us what you think about that and the need for independent research? Thank you. Definitely. I, I think um, that particular event is, is quite striking, but uh, striking in a way that it's not uh, she's not the only one to to have gone through that particular journey. Uh, Pick Tech have they, they do have a history of doing doing this for people who say things that are really important to be said um, and being fired for for doing so. Now, um, I would say this is a message that we need to take as um, we we need to take note of the fact that we can't rely on big tech to self govern to. Uh, keep themselves accountable to have the, the the good of the public in mind because that's not how the public uh, the, the, or, or these these private companies are are designed right uh, they're profit motiv motivated and so that means we need different accountability measures uh, and we do not have concrete regulatory schemes that allow us to uh, keep those checks and balances with big tech. Um, that means I think, and, and one of the reasons why I came back to academia after trying out a, a startup and a think tank and all that is because academia is where we can do this kind of research and have it out into the world without the same, without going through the same kind of consequences. Thank you very much. Okay, another question in the chat. You mentioned that children were affected in different ways when interacting with robots. Would certain design choices or applications inherently modify the next generation's perception and interaction with these robots? And what choices do we have to make here? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, one of the yeah, one of the examples that I tell um, tell other people, and I I, I don't know uh, how my sister feels about this, but <laughs> um, I have a little nephew, and and my sister told me that you know um, guess what the second word of, of your nephew is because um, he's, he's, he just turned three now. Uh, and she said, the second word is Google. <laughs> um, and the reason for this is because she has a Google Home at home and she uses it quite frequently. And so um, if I were to tell you my, my second word as a baby was Google, then it would make no sense, right? <laughs> because the, the Google Home didn't exist uh, back then. And, and this is essentially an example illustrating how any kind of technology is coming into the, into the lives of children um, who are actively developing actually change their perception of the world or how to interact with the world in the first place. Um, 
the way children respond to robots is, uh, more broadly speaking, is a very active topic, um, and we don't have clear answers to what you're what you're uh, asking, which is what choices do we have to make here? <laughs> which is we we do need to do a thorough um, layer of uh, ethics research in looking at in what application context can we bring interactive robots into. Um, or deploy an interactive robots, and um, within that context, how where can we observe differences in the way children behave, or see the world, or think about the world through these robots? Um, one easy example that crosses both the AI boundary as well as the, the physical robotics boundaries is the transfer of information. Um, a lot of uh, startups are really interested in developing these educational systems where children can tune into um, into their, their iPad uh, learning apps um, and now they can do it with its interactive robots but that also means that robots become an info a source of information and you can also easily see how you can abuse that relationship and um, feed in information or ed educational content that can be quite political um, quite problematic and so on and so forth and uh, building in some sort of guidance into that system would be an urgent item for sure, but that's just one of many. Does that answer your question, Victor? Hopefully. Yes, thank you. That was, that was very interesting. <laughs> Hello, I have a question. I was wondering, in your opinion, do you think that there's like a particular sector like industry where there's not enough focus on like either like robo ethics or AI ethics right now. You mean an application domain? Yeah, or just like any certain hmm. industry. Like I noticed during your talk, you mentioned a lot about like home care, like that's robotics are uh, heavily used in that. Do you think that there's a specific industry right now that we aren't really paying much attention to that we should be? I see. Yeah. Um, Hmm. It's, it's very hard to single out <laughs> because there's so much. <laughs> um, I would say, I mean, so autonomous cars, care robots, or even, even sex robots, those are very controversial um, areas where it's very easy for me to talk about because it, it, um, it's easy to convey certain, certain messages. But if you think about uh, systems like collaborative robots, um, where robots are coming into manufacturing facilities. You, you already know that manufacturing facilities have lots of robots already, but the ones that we're developing are the ones where they can physically interact with people without any physical barriers. When you go to a manufacturing facility in Toyota, for example, all of the cars are painted by robots and they have a thick shield of glass, <laughs> glass shield, so to speak, uh, to separate the people. Now, imagine an assembly line where you were you were doing your assembly of the engines or different parts of the, of the car and the robot is helping you to do that um, just by changing the rhythmic behavior of that robot just doing going back and forth you can also change the pace at, at which the the person interacting with the robot is moving you can lead the person to slow down or speed up uh, that's called an entrainment effect, and that's that's something that we naturally do when we walk side by side with other humans. Uh, but we're starting to see more of that impact in in robot to human entrainment as well. Uh, what are some of the ergonomic Im implications of this? What are some of the ethical implications of it? Because we don't necessarily notice it when that happens. Uh, all of those are a little bit more intricate to to get into, but also it issues we we do need to think about as well. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Hello, I had a question. So what are your thoughts about uh, ethics in computer vision? For example, like there was this American company that was extracting facial, like that was collecting everyone's facial data. But uh, even though it's frowned upon in the West, like in America and Canada, but suppose they go to a country where people are not that informed about AI ethics, so the governments are that informed. Mm -hmm. If someone wants to, they can just do whatever they want, to, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, yeah. what do you think we should be able to, like, what do you think we can do against this? Mm -hmm. um, I think there are two parts to your question, actually. So, the, the ethical implications of computer vision is, is one kind of broader topic. Uh, but I think what you're really asking is really about the 
um, the jurisdictional issues or the, the issue of um, policy making or decision making about these technologies deployed in different countries like low resource countries is that right yes exactly yeah yeah um yeah this was actually a, a topic that came up in in my work with the with the united nations where um one of the one of the recurring themes was really that ai ai more broadly speaking and robotics even even more so um is a type of technology that's really dominated by certain countries certain powerhouses. And because of that, uh, they tend to set the rules or the rules of the road, so to speak. Um, a lot of the a lot of the countries have a problem of um, a problem with the idea of just taking the policies or regulatory um, uh, structures or even principles and translating that into their, their countries or their communities, in part because they do not reflect the values that are ingrained in their own communities. So there is a huge power imbalance there. There's also a challenge where if you were to start thinking about regulating AI um, with communities where they haven't really seen a lot of AI related um, technology before, then the kind of um, disparity in the discourse they can have with the community is very different. I think there has to be much more efforts done to level the, the playing field, uh, but not a lot being done that I know of. Uh, so that there is definitely a problem there. Yeah, not a very good solution. Solution is an answer for you, but um, but yeah, it, it is absolutely a huge issue, and and it's not just about AI either. Um, it, it has been the case for um, management of data. You know, the cross jurisdictional issues related to to data, where data is stored, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, These border issues are very tricky. Okay, thank you to everyone for the questions. And once again, thank you to Professor Moon for the really great talk. I'm going to stop the recording.